try and compensate for a beautiful sunny day in April. So thank you all very much for spending part of your afternoon or the first part of your afternoon here. I'll try and um, make this as um, uh, clear and entertaining as possible, recognizing the competition. Um, and what I'd like to do is spend about 35 minutes or so walking through of the presentation, then throw it up open for questions. And the subject is really, again, the title here, The Myth of a Freight-Dependent Economy. It's, it's one of the most durable and widely repeated statements about our economy. We're told by uh, the editor, editors of major uh, publications. We're told by a raft of interest groups that we have a freight-dependent economy, that our economy can't survive without moving freight. And um, more pointedly, the implication is unless we spend more money um, on expanding the capacity of our freight system, somehow our economy can't grow. And I'd like to challenge that, that particular perception today, and I'll present um, a, a bunch of data on that. Just by way of background, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I run an economic consulting firm here in town called Impresa Consulting. We do regional economic analysis. We really look at urban and uh, metropolitan economies to try and understand what makes them tick try and identify the most successful regional economies, and then extract from their performance lessons about what it takes to succeed, particularly in the kind of economy that we find ourselves in today, which is an increasingly globalized, knowledge-driven economy. Uh, the principal endeavor I'm working on right now is something called City Observatory. City Observatory is sponsored by the Knight Foundation, not, not Phil, but the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Um, and we're focused on what it takes to make cities succeed. And you can visit our website, cityobservatory.org. Um, we comment daily on urban and metropolitan policy issues and do um, our own uh, directed research on issues relating to economic opportunity, poverty, migration, housing, and transportation. Um, so uh, I invite you to have a look at City Observatory. We try to be very active on a daily basis in what we think are the most interesting and provocative conversations about cities and regional economies. So with that as a quick introduction, let me tell you about the points I'll cover today. First, I want to, at a very broad level, talk about what we think drives our economy uh, and try and get the, the horse and the cart in the right order when it comes to talking about freight transportation. Um, then I'll recite um, some, some facts, some statistics on what we know about um, what's driving economic growth, and in particular the relationship between transportation, freight transportation, and economic growth, both nationally and particular to the Portland and Oregon economies. Then I'll give you a couple of case examples. One is a case example of where a major piece of the freight transportation system goes away and what the effect of that was on the economy. And then I'll talk about an industry that's growing very rapidly, even though it has almost nothing to do with moving physical freight, to sort of bookend the idea that our economy and economic growth is dependent on, on freight. Um, then I'll talk about um, some of the academic evidence, recognizing we're here at Portland State University. I'll touch on you know, sort of the literature review pieces tied into the broader literature about what we understand about transportation, about regional economic growth. And then we'll have some time for questions and discussion. So um, this is the mental image I'm convinced that most policymakers are carrying around in their head when they say freight dependent. That uh, it's an era, uh, you know, maybe 100, 150 years ago, where if the railroad came to your town, your destiny was assured. If the railroad bypassed your town, you were economically destitute. Um, and I think people still think in those terms. And, and that may certainly have been true um, 150 years ago in the West. Uh, and the routing of railroads certainly had a lot to do with the development of economic activity. But things have changed a lot since then. And uh, transportation, which was once, once an absolutely critical factor, is now essentially a ubiquitous factor. We can move things pretty much everywhere. And particularly when it comes to bits, we can move them uh, equally well from just about any location. Now, um, I'm just going to digress a little bit into um, a, a vacation slideshow, show you some pictures from my vacation to Italy last year. So I was in this little town called Cortona in Tuscany. And we were in a little pizza parlor in Cortona. And on the menu in a pizza parlor in this little town in Italy was Widmer Beer from Portland, Oregon. This is a picture of the, of the server there who's holding a bottle of Widmer IPA. 
in this little town in Italy. Now, why is that bottle of beer in Italy, and what does that tell us about transportation? Well, first of all, it tells you that, um, you know, that there's a lot of distance between here and there, um, a huge amount of distance. There's also a lot of really good beer between here and there. But the point is, we have a very distinctive, high-quality, world-class product that's made here in Portland. And the cost of moving it to Italy is negligible in terms of putting it on the menu in a, even a tiny restaurant there. So the reason that bottle of beer is there is not because we're particularly good in Portland at moving things, but because we're particularly good at making something of very high quality. And by the same token, you could walk into the Safeway up here on, uh, on Jefferson, and you could buy a bottle of Italian mineral water. And again, the reason that's here is because it's a really good product and because the cost of moving it is almost immaterial to where it's here. So what drives economies is not the physical cost of moving things. It's your ability to create really good ideas, products, and services. And that's, you know, if you take away nothing else from this presentation, take that away. That it's the being good at making things is what drives the economy, not moving things. And I'll illustrate that by looking at um, some specific data. But we essentially we have this backwards logic. We think, tend to think that we export things because we're good at moving them, but in fact we, um, are good, we export things because we're good at making them. Now the other thing I'll say is there, there's a little bit of, I, I would argue, rhetorical sleight of hand going on when somebody says the economy is freight dependent. Of course it's freight dependent. I mean, if you can't move freight, then you don't have an economy, absolutely. But we're, that's not the relevant question. Uh, the relevant question is whether any feasible changes to the freight transportation system would have any measurable effect on our prospects for growth. And you could equally argue that the Oregon economy, the Portland economy, is just as caffeine dependent, just as electricity dependent, just as internet dependent as it is freight dependent. That's sort of a meaningless statement in an important way. And the real question is, what at the margin can you invest in that will improve your economy? And I'll argue that uh, for the most part, investments at the margin in freight have very little to do with economic growth. So let me launch into a series of now facts about freight and freight movement in the United States. And most of this is, learned, is gleaned from uh, the recent commodity flow survey that was produced um, uh, by Census Bureau working with U.S. Department of Transportation. It's the big definitive national survey of freight, freight movement, um, and, and uh, different modes of transportation in the U.S. Uh, fact number one, most freight is heavy, low value, and local. Now, one of the things that you will inevitably encounter if you read, as I do, freight plans is reference to sort of what I would call the Carl Sagan view of freight. There are billions and billions of tons of stuff that are moved. There are billions and billions of ton miles of freight. And we're supposed to be, I think, overwhelmed by the sheer size of the numbers involved. But when you look carefully at what's moved and what, and what moves, um, it, it breaks down into, into some distinctive categories. And most of it is not stuff that really is particularly time dependent or particularly valuable. So here is one way of looking at it, which is to, to break out products that get moved by industry and, and to break them out um, according to how much output a typical worker produces in a given day. Now, some industries, the mineral industry, and here I'm thinking of sand and gravel, uh, as well as, uh, as other bulk minerals, uh, produces about five tons of output per worker per year. Somebody in the electronics business, on average, produces maybe 50 pounds of output per year. Somebody in the professional services or software business produces, oh, this is per day, uh, produces about zero pounds of output per, per worker per day. So depending on which industry you're talking about, we're talking about very, very different quantities of freight that they have to move. And the other thing is if, if you go down this list from top to bottom, you basically go from slow-growing or contracting sectors of the Oregon and national economies to the fastest-growing sectors of our economy. So increasingly, the things that are propelling economic growth are the things that generate the least physical output and require the least movement of goods. And in fact, most of the stuff that moves, uh, in, that gets transported, um, is very low value stuff. It's gravel, stone, wood, non-metallic mineral, minerals, uh, and things like petroleum and oil products. So fully two thirds of the physical volume of stuff that gets moved is, is very, very low value. And to give you an idea of how, what the difference in the value is, you know, the, the average value of a pound of electronics 
and this is against all kinds of electronics, is about 40 bucks a pound. Machinery is about seven bucks a pound. Wood products is about 24 cents a pound. Wheat works out to about 11 cents a pound. So if you think about what kind of willingness there is to pay to move things, there's obviously a very high willingness to pay to move electronics, and it's a very negligible part of the delivered cost of that product. For those low-value commodities, it makes a bigger difference, um, but they don't have a big economic impact. And most freight moves very locally. Heavy, bulky stuff is expensive to ship a long way, so very little of it moves a long distance. About three-quarters of the outbound shipments from Portland um, end up in Oregon. About 60% um, uh, of the inbound shipments to Portland come from other destinations in Oregon. And about two-thirds of all the shipments moving in the Portland metropolitan area move less than 50 miles in terms of physical bulk. So what we tend to think about... Um, movement of freight in sort of an international context, most movement of physical stuff is actually very short distances, tends to stay in the local economy, and therefore isn't terribly sensitive to, um, or it isn't very sensitive, or isn't very important in driving overall economic growth. So fact number two looks at, goes from that static recognition of what's going on in terms of variance um, across commodities and industries, and looks at how the Economy is changing over time. And essentially, our economy, like the U.S. economy, is consistently shifting to lighter, higher-value products. And as a result, the volume of freight that we're moving in Oregon has declined pretty sharply. Now, this is data from the 2012 uh, Commodity uh, Flow Survey conducted by the Census Bureau. And essentially uh, shows you um, physical stuff made in Oregon divided into two categories. The blue category is electronics and machinery. So think of high-tech, high-value output uh, of physical stuff. Um, the red is everything else that has moved in the Oregon economy. The value of electronics and machinery is up about 50% uh, in the last five years. The value of everything else has declined by about 12%. So very clearly, the growth of the economy is not driven by those bulky, low-value sectors. It's driven by electronics and machinery. And that isn't – now we're, and we're totally ignoring the service sector of the economy. This is just physical things that we move, and the growth is overwhelmingly in high-value things. And as it turns out, when you add all those things together, um, we're producing about the same level of output, physical stuff, that we did – prior to the Great Recession. We fully recovered in terms of the value of, of output, but the physical quantity of stuff that we produced is 40% less than it was. So we've become much more physically efficient in the Oregon economy, or put another way, much more of our output is these very light, very high value goods, and to some extent services, uh, rather than bulky low value ones. Um, and the same is true of our export markets. So th this chart, the previous chart, is basically all the physical output in Oregon. This is what we export. Same pattern holds here. The value of exports actually increased sharply. It's up about 55% from 2007 levels. But the physical volume of what we exported from Oregon is down about 44%. So, I, you know, if nothing else, I think it shows you that the physical movement of goods has almost completely decoupled from whether your economy grows or not. So I think that's powerful evidence that we do not, in any meaningful sense, in any meaningful statistical sense, have a freight-dependent economy here. And then that shows up in particular modes of transportation. Commodity flow survey shows that ton miles of travel in Oregon are down about 40% compared to 2007, um, which is very consistent with that earlier evidence. And so at the same time, our economy is growing and decoupling, and that shows up in the macro statistics as well. So um, this is a set of data from, uh, for the national economy and uses uh, something called the CAS Freight Index, which is an industry-wide measure of the total value of freight shipments in the United States. It's a quantity measure of, of shipments. And what I've done is norm that to um, real GDP in the United States. So this is how much physical stuff we move relative to the output of the economy. The gray bars in this chart correspond to recessions. And what you see here is that there's been a precipitous and sustained decline in uh, 
freight movement per unit of gross domestic product in the United States. This is normed basically um, to, uh, to uh, 2000 and uh, 2004, equaling roughly 100. And you can see that we're more than 20% below um, the historic level, the 2000 or 2004 level, of uh, freight movement per unit of gross domestic product. And significantly, you know, while you can see a big decline coincident with the Great Recession, that's in this gray bar right here, there is that precipitous drop, um, you don't see any rebound as the economy recovers. So what that suggests is, you know, we, we think of recessions as, um, you know, temporary reversals, but they also signal structural change in the economy. And I think what that recession signals is a structural shift away from uh, a, a higher level of freight dependence to a much lower level, about a 20, 25% lower level of freight movement uh, per unit of GDP. So we produce more output, but we do it much more efficiently in terms of moving things. Um, this is the closest approximation I can give you of um, the same idea for um, the Oregon economy. This is the amount of um, freight movement, truck freight movement, as judged by weight mile receipts, uh, and it's been normed for uh, changes in the tax rate. But basically, the volume of, of truck freight in Oregon compared to the gross domestic product of Oregon. And you can see that's been in pretty steady decline over time, and that decline accelerated after about 2005. So again, the Oregon economy, the U.S. economy, both becoming much more efficient in terms of producing more GDP, but do, using less freight movement to do it. And then that shows up in, in truck uh, freight movement levels. So these are truck volumes. Um, this is the total volume of uh, truck freight uh, in Oregon. Um, and again, it's dropped about 15% from what it was prior uh, to the Great Recession and has not rebounded as the economy has bounced back. And one of my favorite uh, examples, we were told a few years ago that we desperately needed to spend $3 billion to build a, um, a new um, I-5 bridge connecting Portland and Vancouver um, because we were such a freight-dependent economy. Uh, well, in fact, uh, and that was proposed in, in, in about 2006, 2007. Since then, the volume of freight moving across the Columbia River on the I-5 and I-205 bridges declined, or combined, has dropped about 20% and has stayed down during that period of time. So the notion that somehow we needed to spend billions of dollars to accommodate more freight um, was certainly not um, uh, uh, borne, borne out by um, the history of the last several years. Um, and that's essentially, though, still what the region's plans call for. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but there's sort of an article of faith, um, both in the metropolitan plans, the metro plan, and the state plan, that freight is both critical to our economy and growing very rapidly, and if we don't do something to accommodate it, that, that our economy will somehow suffer. A typical statement is drawn from the uh, Metro uh, 2010 Regional Freight Plan, which says, trade volumes in Portland are expected to double by 2035 to 600 million tons, and the system will, quote, need to absorb a doubling of freight volumes. Um, there's no evidence for that now. Um, that may have been true a decade ago, and this study was based on uh, uh, projections that were made about 2005 or so, but the current data from the Commodity Flow Survey, from the weight mile tax, from every other indicator we have says almost no increase. In fact, a sustained uh, reduction and decline in freight movement uh, in Oregon, and then a complete decoupling from the economy as well. Now, I appreciate that this is, you know, as an economist, all this is very uh, heavily statistically oriented, but let me give you two examples of changes, both first to the freight system and then to an important industry that illustrate how, in practice, um, there's no connection between freight movement and the economy. The first example I'll give you is um, container movement. Now, I think it, it's really interesting. I think we have this, again, sort of rhetorical um, uh, issue in Portland. The name of the town is Port Land. You know, the implication somehow is the port is really important to our economy. Um, and um, there's, there's sort of a set of creation myths about Portland. I don't know if you've ever heard these that, that sort of begin at the confluence of two mighty rivers. So you've got the Columbia and the Willamette Rivers coming together, you know, you, you, bodies of water, transportation. There's sort of a belief that that's 
critical to the, to the growth of the economy. It clearly had a lot to do with why there was a town site a couple hundred meters from here uh, that flourished in 1840s and, and beat out a bunch of other competing town sites. Uh, but that does very little to explain the kind of economy that we have today. Um, and no, no, in no case is it clearer, I think, than when you look at container shipping uh, and, and the marine terminal business. Um, and what I'll do is look at uh, Portland's marine terminals. Um, and the high value component of uh, maritime commerce is clearly containers. High value stuff moves in containers, low value stuff moves, moves in bulk shipment. Um, and the, the, the concentration of containers in particular ports is a really strong indicator of where uh, value goes. So in the last year, or a little over the last year, the two principal container ship lines calling on Portland have both discontinued service. Um, in February of last year, um, Hanjin, the Korean shipper, left, and uh, the German shipper, Hapa Gloyd, left in April of last year. They essentially eliminated about 95% of all of the container movement uh, by ship out of the port of Portland, essentially idling uh, the cranes that you see there at Terminal 6. Now, to put this in context, this is actually not a terribly surprising development when you look at the trend in container traffic in the Port of Portland over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, our share of West Coast container traffic peaked 20 years ago at about 3%, 3, 3% uh, 3 of the total West Coast uh, handling of, of uh, containers. And as you see there, there's been a little variation year to year, but pretty much in steady decline. We were down under 1% a few years ago, and it's essentially just all gone away. Now, I could spend some time talking about load centering and the uh, competitive advantages that attach to being a, load po uh, a large port and being able to handle um, the very much larger container ships that we have today. But the point is, you look at that, you see that very, it's an industry very much in decline that we were never a very big share of. This is actually probably a better way of looking at it. I've just scaled the, the axis there to show you where 100% is. Port of Portland was always a bit player in the container market, um, and it's essentially just gone away. Um, but that's actually not, um, in, not uh, unusual. Um, a, a lot of segments of the ports business have been in decline in the past year or so. These are the ports numbers from a couple of months ago. Their container business was off 86%. Their grain business in volume terms off 41%. Their bulk mineral business, again, in volume terms off 9%. Their break bulk business off 85%. A little bit of an increase in cars imported. Um, very weak performance there. Now, you would think in a city named Portland, when the container business goes away, when the port traffic is dropping like crazy, if we really have a freight-dependent economy, this must signal a disaster for the regional economy, right? Not so much. Uh, Portland's job growth accelerated in the last year from 3.2% a year ago to 3.8% a day. That's the fastest rate of growth that we've experienced in almost 20 years. The Portland metropolitan region has added 38,000 jobs since Hanjin left. Uh, the unemployment rate, ha which has been declining, continued to decline, is at 4.4%. That's the lowest level in 16 years. And these are all numbers since the February loss of Hanjin. So if you have this sort of mythical belief in the importance of container movement in particular, but port activity generally to the economy, this should disabuse you of that. Um, our, our economy and the health of our economy and the growth of our economy was scarcely affected. There's, there's no discernible effect um, in terms of the aggregates uh, from the loss of Hanjin. Um, and in fact, we had the second fastest growing regional economy in the United States. And, that, and we hit an all-time peak uh, in employment. Only the San Jose uh, metropolitan economy, among large metropolitan economies in the United States, recorded a faster level of growth in 2015. So very little evidence that, um, that we have a, a, a trade, or I should say a um, freight-dependent economy. Uh, and the high-tech industry, a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the Oregonian cleverly went and asked a high-tech firm how this would affect them, and they said won't affect us at all. The reason is they don't move anything by slow ships. They send the, thing, the things they export, they, they, they send via air freight, um, and so it's not going to affect them at all. Now, let me shift gears and talk about sort of another way to think about this. So it should be abundantly clear that the loss of a, a, of a particular component of the freight system had negligible effects. But the converse is also true. 
we've been able to grow some seg segments of the economy, grow them quite rapidly, and be very successful um, without any reliance. In fact, a much diminished reliance on freight. And one of the best examples of that is the athletic and outdoor cluster. Athletic and outdoor is basically, you know, think of Nike, Adidas, Columbia Sportswear, and about 400 other firms in the Portland metropolitan area that make um, gear and apparel that we use in sporting and, and outdoor uses. Um, that's a very robust, rapidly growing industry. It employed, and this was a couple of years ago, it's up probably closer to 16, 17,000 jobs now, has hundreds of firms. It pays very high wages, much higher than the regional average. Uh, it's a global leading industry here. Maybe you know that Under Armour is um, uh, taking over the w old YMCA facility south of Dunaway Park to have their North American headquarters here to tap into the talent uh, pool that exists for, for footwear uh, design. So it's very fast growing, very entrepreneurial, very successful globally, and for the most part moves almost no freight through here. In fact, we specialize in Portland in the high order sort of design and managerial functions of the um, uh, athletic and outdoor industry. Uh, this chart is actually taken from the Adidas annual report. And it's really clear that Portland specializes in marketing, design, research, and development, and then some of the global operation ma financial management. The sourcing, supply chain, and distribution and sales tends to be done in the rest of the world. Now, just to put a, to put a map to that, um, so here we are in Portland. Um, that's where the design and high-level execution are taking place. A lot of stuff gets sent to China to be produced, China, Vietnam, and other locations. Um, that yellow arrow is um, most of that gear and apparel and footwear gets shipped back to the United States, chiefly to the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. It goes by train from L.A. and Long Beach, in the case of Nike, to their national distribution center in Memphis, and then gets distributed throughout the United States. Nike closed its Oregon warehouses uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and now a world leader, a globally competitive company in Portland in, that's in, in leading in this industry has very little to do with freight movement. One thing they do that is significant is they make air soles, which are proprietary technology that they're trying to protect from being imitated. They make those in the United States and ship them via air freight to China. But in terms of the supply chain, it, the physical movement of stuff, very little of it happens here, and yet we have a flourishing industry. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is we've specialized in the high-value end of that industry. Production workers in this industry make on the order of 2 to $3 an hour. The people who work in the distribution centers in places like Memphis make about 12 to $15 an hour. And the all-in wages of, of designers, financial and marketing people works out to more than $40 an hour. So if, if you want to pick a segment of this industry to be involved in, we've chosen the right segment. And even if we were to try and bring in the distribution jobs, they would be lower, much, more, much lower paid jobs on average than the ones that we've already got in that industry. So that's the second example. When we lost the freight segment, particularly the, cargo in the, the marine cargo industry, we suffered almost no effects. We've managed to expand and uh, increase our lead in athletic and outdoor and diminish its uh, demands on the freight system. So we're able to grow new industries without reliance on freight. Um, so it, l let me just tie this into um, the kind of the literature review on this. What we know about how freight movement affects um, the location of economic activity. Um, I'll turn first to Ed Glazer, who's sort of the dean of regional economists in the United States. He wrote more than a decade ago that basically the big decline in freight costs over the last century you know, sort of put the railroad era and the old steamship era way behind you and think about how much freight costs have declined over the last century. It means that um, from the standpoint of the goods producing sector, it's better to assume that the cost of moving goods is zero um, than it is to assume that it's an important part of the production process. So if you want to explain why industries locate and why they grow where they do, um, disregard transportation costs. That's what Glazer uh, concludes, because it's such a small fraction uh, of, uh, of the costs. Um, the other thing we know is that while it may have been true that building railroads um, 150 years ago 
and building the interstate highway system starting about 50 years ago um, had some effects on the economy that we're in a period of much diminished returns for investment in highway infrastructure. Um, and you know, the way to think about it is the first interstate highway system you would build, you would expect to have a big impact on the economy. Building a duplicate, a second interstate highway system would be expected to have almost no or very much, very much diminished impact. And that's, in fact, what the literature shows. Um, uh, Chad Shirley and Cliff Winston from Brookings Institution you know, essentially computed the, the rate of return, the economic rate of return from highway investments in each of the last uh, or in the, in, in the last three decades. They, it, was, it was a study they did a little over 10 years ago. But basically, you know, early on, we got very high economic returns. As late as the 1970s, we were getting double-digit returns. By the 1980s, that had fallen to about a 5% return. By the 1990s, it was a 1% or 2% return that we were getting from incremental investments in added highway capacity. Um, a couple of years ago, Randy Everts from the Upjohn Institute um, uh, updated and annualized those estimates. Very similar pattern that he gets from from uh, that. So, and and what he's laid in here is the you know the the interest rate for the economy. I think sort of the long bond rate, and you know so very clearly in the in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, investing in additional highway capacity made a lot of sense. It was essentially free. You were getting really big returns well above the cost of money. But for the last decade or more, the returns have been plummeting and are very close to, or, and now, uh, at least according to Ebert's latest estimates, are below the rate of interest. So that, that, that essentially you're spending money on it, but you're not getting a return uh, that, that is equal to um, what you would expect in the rest of the economy. So... Uh, the initial investments that you might make would have some significant paybacks, but the kinds of uh, incremental investments that we have to make today seem to have very little impact on um, the overall economy. And then the final point that I'll make is um, when it comes to thinking about the freight transportation, transportation system, particularly the truck freight transportation system, um, there are a lot of costs that we incur as a society that are not reflected in the prices that we pay or in the decisions that we make to move the freight, um, uh, particularly by highway. Oh, let me get one, one more study before I launch into that. Uh, Duranton and Turner and Morrow a couple of years ago, um, they, they did a real nice job of looking cross-sectionally at cities in the United States to see what the impact of added um, highway capacity was on the character of the economy. And what they found was, um, places that made a bigger investment in their highway transportation system did move physically more stuff, um, but they didn't produce any more value. So, you know, their takeaway was that in, uh, incremental investments in highway capacity essentially served to um, subsidize more movement of physical stuff. They don't make your economy more productive in uh, dollar value in economic terms. Um, which is a really interesting study if you want to read it. So final point here. Um, when we look at trucks, you know, I would describe them as the 18-wheeler welfare Cadillac, um, that we spend a huge amount of money subsidizing uh, truck movement, particularly on highways, for a variety of reasons. These are the estimates from the Congressional Budget Office from a study they did last year, that when you add in um, the pollution costs associated with trucking, the uh, highway damage costs, the um, global warming and the um, traffic uh, uh, crash costs that are associated with trucking, it works out to between uh, about 60 and $120 billion a year in excess of what trucks pay um, in insurance, in, uh, in road user fees and the like. And that that subsidy works out to about 20 to 50 cents a mile for trucking. So... There's a good argument to be made that in addition to not stimulating the economy, that um, marginal investments in trucking that encourage more use of trucking are increasing our social and environmental costs. Uh, and that's another good reason to um, maybe think twice about relying more heavily on um, uh, freight and, uh, as a way to, um, to grow the economy. So very quickly then, just to summarize, there is a very clear decoupling of uh, economic growth in the Portland metropolitan area in the state of Oregon, as well as the national economy from freight movement. We're producing more valuable output. We're doing it by producing less stuff and moving it less and moving it shorter distances. Um, 
even a very uh, significant reduction in uh, freight movement, the loss of containers, has had an almost neg negligible effect on the Oregon economy. Um, and um, we've been able to grow new sectors of the economy. I've talked about athletic and outdoor, but could easily talk about the high-tech industry. And those sectors are growing not because we're good at moving freight, but because we're good at making terrific world-class product. And the academic evidence strongly suggests that there's very little reason to believe that incremental investments in freight movement today are going to pay very big dividends for growing the economy. And in fact, there are significant social and environmental costs that are associated with that. So while that, you know, that metaphor, that image we have of the railroad coming to the old western town um, is a very powerful one, it's no longer an accurate one for describing the way our economies work. Uh, and for those reasons, I really think that the idea that we have a freight-dependent economy uh, is really a myth that needs to be buried. Thanks. Just a reminder before you ask your question, if you're a student, give us your first and last name so we can log in. I have a question, uh, Barb Payne. Uh, as far as the metro study, um, I didn't catch whether City Observatory was around when, that's, when that came out in 2010. So I guess my question would be, were you? Um, I'm sure you were, probably thinking about these things. Um, did, you, uh, did you collaborate with them on this? Or did you, if not, did you have something to say publicly or with the folks over at Metro after the study came out? To you know, say, hey, you're wrong, and this is what we have to prove that. Um, city Observatory started about a year and a half, not quite two years ago. Um, this is new research that we've done in the last few months. Okay. Um, we've shared it with um, folks, including folks at Metro, um, so it's available to them. I know Metro's in kind of in the throes of its next iteration of its regional freight plan. We'll be happy to make it this information available to them. Hope they take a close look at it. And we're happy to answer their question or, uh, about our analysis. Are they interested in knowing what you have to say? Um, you know, I've gotten some inquiries. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know what they're going to do with it, but um, it's not that they're unaware of it now. So. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Mark Hedges. Um, so it sounds like um, your presentation is about sort of rhetorical focus by policymakers that, you know, we need this great expansion based off this. Um, ID you mentioned the railroad going to town. Um, could that just be do you see like a daily kind of confirmation bias that you know I go on the highway at rush hour, um, everything's slowed down, and so a policymaker in their car, you know, is idling there saying, This is having an impact on freight, hence we need more roads, more rail, these could just be a factor in this push. Um, I mean yeah, 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 absolutely. I think you're no. Um, two things. I think one um, there is this sort of projection that people think, oh, I'm stuck in traffic, so that means everybody's stuck in traffic, that means trucks are stuck in traffic, that means bad things are happening. That's, at a personal level, I think people think that way. Um, and that's, not, that's understandable. Now, I'll address whether I think it's right in a second. Um, I also think um, there's a bit of salesmanship going on here where you know, pe people are using freight as a stalking horse, saying, oh, well, you know, I... Congestion is an issue, but boy, if we don't fix this freight problem, our economy is in deep trouble. Um, but when you look at it more carefully, a couple things are true. First, um, as I said here, there's this, there is this real decoupling. Second, and we analyzed this for the Columbia River Crossing project, and you know the the the, the interesting thing about freight freight companies, particularly truck freight companies, is they're not stupid, and they know when traffic congestion occurs. And actually, they're very sophisticated about scheduling and routing, and they avoid uh, congested periods. So when you look at the I-5 bridge of, between Portland and Vancouver, the lowest level of truck volume during the day uh, is during the PM rush hour in the northbound direction. That is, freight managers don't send trucks over the bridge then. They, they route them at other times of the day. Um, and, and, and in fact, um, that's a very, from a, from a transportation system management standpoint, that's exactly what you want them to do. You want them to use capacity 
when it's not scarce, and you want them to avoid using it when it's scarce. Um, and the fact that we don't price it correctly gives you know, some perverse incentives. But it's very clear um, that f the, f the freight people are very adept at coping with uh, um, uh, congestion uh, and rooting around it. The other thing it tells you is, despite all of the you know, bloviating about just in time, there's enough flexibility in the, in the freight management system to let them do that. It's not like they have to send that truck over the interstate bridge at 4.30 in the afternoon. I mean, for some of them, it probably is. And if we wanted to do toll lanes at the, at the rush hour, I would strongly support <laughs> that. But for most of them, it's like, no, we can adjust the schedule and avoid um, uh, that. And we have enough flexibility, particularly with the vast bulk of freight, which is really low value, in order to do that. Thanks. I had kind of a, a similar question, but I guess no more follow-up. So if the issue of freight is sort of a Trojan horse to talk about congestion, um, but the freight people, the people who are you know, self-identified as freight advocates, members of the Oregon Trucking Association, Portland Freight Committee, they're very passionate about this idea that we've got to improve things for freight in order to improve the economy overall. So what do you think, that, you know, why are they approaching it from this way? Do you think they actually believe? Well, you know, again, as economists, I'd say, you know, put your money where your mouth is. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to have the public sector spend money on stuff that benefits them. I would love to see the city of Portland spend money in my neighborhood, in front of my house, that benefits me. They're making that argument. But I think the real question is, how much value do they attach to it? Would they be willing to pay more for it? Do they um, get benefit from it? Um, or is it just a straightforward transfer of revenue to spend it on things that benefit them as opposed to things that benefit other people? The other thing I'd say is it's not clear to me that from a regional perspective that um, freight movement is a competitive issue. That is, um, it may lower your costs of your freight company if we make this particular improvement. But there's no evidence that that changes the overall competitiveness of the regional economy uh, in terms of its ability to compete against other places. It might make your, your terminal location might work better. You might end up paying your drivers slightly less. But that probably doesn't redound to the benefit of the overall regional economy. And a lot of this does have to do with physical access to particular locations. I want to see an improvement at this location because then my site becomes more of a, more, more valuable because there are more things I can do on it. That doesn't change the overall level of economic activity in the region. It just makes a particular site more valuable than it would otherwise be. And people, you know, unsurprisingly, will advocate for that. Can I ask you a follow-up? Of course. So um, the... Uh, now I've kind of forgotten what the, the follow-up was, but um, yeah, it's only just, I'll, I'll raise my hand when I think okay. it might be, sorry. Yeah, will this PowerPoint be available? Absolutely. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the, Chris can tell me where it's posted yeah. here. We'll make it available through, through the university. Yeah. And also, um, uh, you'll be able to get through um, city territory as well. Roger. It came back. So, so what, you know, what I've noticed in uh, transportation planning is that we're often not measuring the effects that we're having. So we have a lot of goals related to mode split and things like that, and we're not really measuring them. <coughs> we're going to talk about that here in a month or so. So what, what's wrong with our planning processes? What's wrong with our political leadership, perhaps, that we're not paying attention to um, information, to, you know, this kind of information to guide our investment? <coughs> Um, you know, that's, that's a good question, and I, 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 the, as I said, the, the freight plans that I've read are the sort of the, the Carl Sagan uh, recitation, billions and billions. There are lots, and, lots of freight moving, it's growing really rapidly, and then there's no connection between that observation and where ought we to spend money. What are, and, and you know, from the economist or from a financial standpoint, where are the greatest returns, and how do you measure the nature of those returns? It's really just sort of hand-waving about this, and then we'll choose some projects. And I think that's what's needed is, you know, what are your criteria for choosing 
uh, and demonstrating that there are uh, uh, real economic returns to these things. Yeah. Just earlier this week, um, Otto from the Civil Engineering Department. Yeah. Just earlier this week, Volvo has sent a five truck shipment that drove itself across Europe. Mm -hmm. um, if that technology ever makes it to the US, which we know could potentially not happen, um, do you think that would have a, a beneficial impact on the economy locally um, in terms of not having a driver, not having <clears throat> costs associated with um, human error, so to speak? Um, okay, yeah, I think, no, that's a really interesting question. And I think, um, yeah, the, the effects would not primarily be local. I think they would be national. Okay. Um, that you know, truck truck freight is ubiquitous. It's it, it's the most common mode. It's the most widely used uh, mode, particularly here in the United States. Um, so yeah, driver driverless trucks. You know, so you know, you could think about a million or more um, truck driving jobs going away, um, uh, and that would be probably national in scope. It might improve the competitiveness of truck freight relative to some other modes at the margin. Um, because clearly the driver is your biggest single cost, typically, in keeping the truck on the road. Um, so it would make it a little bit more cost competitive. But then I think the question is, if you were to factor in road pricing and environmental damage and safety costs the way CBO suggests you did, that might, you know, that 40 cents a mile is not quite, but it's, it's, that's a big share of the driver cost right there. Um, but I, you know, I think that's a really interesting question with regard to autonomous vehicles. Is, uh, but it's, but it's, I think a much more. I, I don't see it tipping the balance in favor of any particular locale. Allowing freight to get transferred throughout the states. Yeah, I think. Um, again, and I go back to the to the Glazer point. A couple of the other points are um, transportation is already such a small portion of the delivered cost of most things that it's unlikely to have a big impact. So if you think about really high value things, it's so small already that it's probably not an issue. You know what it might do is if you think about, and I'll take I'll go to the clear other end of the spectrum: gra sand and gravel. Right? Transportation is a big fraction of the delivered cost of that. If you can. Now, if you can get rid of the driver, does that mean, you know, that you ex extend the um, economic viable range of a, of a, um, a, a gravel pit um, by five miles? I don't know, but that's that's where I would expect to see the effects would be in the in the lowest lowest value sets of commodities. Um, but again, that's not really large. That may be important to that industry, but it may it's not really large impact on the overall economy. Uh, Chris, uh, um, so I'm from Southern Oregon, and a big part of the economy there is, is lumber. I, mm -hmm. I guess we, you didn't really, I didn't really hear you talk much about rail. Is that just a really small sector of the economy here in Oregon? Because it seems like virtually all of that lumber freight gets shipped via rail. And so I guess I'm just curious as to, you know, is there any research on that? Um, no, I think you're right that, that particularly finished wood products tend to move by mark, to market by rail out of Oregon. Absolutely the case. Um, and, and again, I'll go back to that. You know, I thought it was sort of a rhetorical uh, argument made about freight dependence. <laughs> Obviously, you need to have a freight system. Obviously, you need to have rail cars and be able to move uh, wood products to market. The, I think the more interesting question is, is there e any feasible set of investments that you can make in that that appreciably change the growth prospects of that industry? And I think with few exceptions, the answer is no. So. Once you have a freight system in place, um, how, bi how big a difference are marginal? How big a difference are marginal changes to it to your to your uh, to your economic growth? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Tracer Burge. Um, uh, it seemed like freight rates like decreased rapidly, and so what's to say that a spike wouldn't be in the near future? And wouldn't that that be would that uh, a investment in the interstate bridge be beneficial? Um, well, let's see. I'm trying to remember the exact trajectory of, of freight rates. They, they, um, 40% or something? Like Pardon? It was like 40% of volume or something like that. Like 
Oh, um, well, what we, just let me, let me back up on the chronology here. So from about 2002, 2003 to 2008, cost of diesel fuel doubled, more than doubled in the United States. And that's, aside from the driver's second biggest cost in, 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 in moving freight. And I think that's part of the reason why you saw the shift away from uh, trucks, particularly uh, you know, in, in 2007, 2008. Oh, obviously, the recession played, played a role, too. But the higher operating costs associated with trucks, the, and which higher freight rates, um, I think led to a couple of things. One is more multimodalism, so people putting, um, putting, putting stuff on rail and putting flat, uh, uh, truck tra uh, trailer on rail. Um, and then also change, and again, has some market effects that, that some things that you used to move, you don't move as far or as often um, uh, because it's more expensive to do so. So I think that's, the, that, that's been, over the last few years anyhow, the effect of higher rates on, on, on volume. A little bit of mode shifting, and I think that's part of the reason why we have lower, um, uh, lower overall truck volumes in Oregon. Yes? I think you put a very convincing case of kind of debunking the means for freight uh, economy, but kind of playing a, a kind of stable advocate here, uh, because the, the time theory is wrong, as you mentioned about the, the gasoline price or the diesel price that has been in the last uh, quite a long maybe a decade or so, that the price has been increasing. But now, with the price decline, I don't suppose maybe there is pickup on the truck traffic. On the other hand, um, nobody has a kind of crystal ball to tell what, whether what will happen uh, in a longer, say, 2030 or 20, even beyond that. And how can we, say, uh, plan for freight? It's, I think, a, a common rationale is we'll probably err on the side that we provide, we'll provide more capacity than need. Uh, so then, then we project it. I think that's probably why Metro is kind of projecting to, to double the, the capacity or to double the volume mm -hmm. by 2035. And what would you say to that? Uh -huh. Well, I think on the, the last part, it's easy. It's like there's a, when, you, when you invest in a bunch of capacity you don't use, you're, you're, you're throwing money away. Um, there are a lot of competing demands for um, public sector resources generally, transportation money in particular. And, you know, for every dollar that you spend on, uh, on trade, freight capacity that you do not need, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, uh, wasting that money and taking it away from other, other p potential needs. You know, as an economist and somebody who's focused on economic development, if I'm thinking about, and I'll go back to Columbia River Crossing, which, again, was really heavily predicated on this as being so important to the region's economy. If you had $3 billion sitting on this table right here, um, I'm sure we can all think of a lot better ways to spend $3 billion to help the Portland economy than having a nicer bridge between Portland and Vancouver. And, and I, I think that that's the challenge going forward is to, kind of um, not get suckered into these following this old myth and think about, well, what are the things that we need to invest in now, like a university, to have a really successful economy 10 and 20 and 30 years from now? Um, now, your, your first question was about um, uh, decline in prices and so on. Yeah, I think you know, there's a really interesting question. You know, Maybe I'll come back in 12 months and we'll look and see what happened to um, truck freight and so on now that diesel prices have dropped by about, you know, 35, 40 percent and uh, a whole bunch of other things have reversed. Um, and, and, and that's a terrific experiment. I mean, really interesting experiment, both, both on the freight side but also on the passenger side too and, and car sales and model choice, vehicle, mo ve uh, fleet mileage, so on. All that stuff is um, worth, worth looking at. I think the thing that's surprising to me is um, when you saw that big decline in um, freight to GDP in the recession, that it didn't bounce back at all. It did, the technical term is dead, count, bat, dead cat bounce. It hit and just, and it's, it hasn't moved at all. Um, 
that may change. I don't know. But it's surprisingly how um, sustained the, um, the relationship has been in, in the wake of the Great Recession. Yeah, Roger. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's a horrible technical term. <laughs> but um, have, you, have you seen um, the, uh, the politics of freight be as strong in other jurisdictions as they seem to be here in Portland? Uh, I don't, I, I, my end is too small to answer that question. I mean, I, I know Portland pretty well. I don't know other places very well at all. So I, I don't know if we're um, special in that regard. Good question. Uh, Chris? Yeah, so the, 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 the macro data, you know, makes a lot of sense with the, with the knowledge economy and everything. The other argument that, you know, that the, the freight industry makes or the discussion they have is, you know, everything that you have you know, comes by the truck. Yeah. So, you know, we bring you everything. I forget what Absolutely. that's So I think I know your answer to the question, but what's your what's your response to that, to that argument? Yeah, and... You know, if there wasn't oxygen here, we couldn't breathe. If the electricity wasn't running in the walls, you wouldn't have an economy at all. You know, you wouldn't have the lights. We wouldn't be doing the webcasts. Yeah, it, it, but that's not the question. The question is not whether you have it at all. Not, I'm not saying that we abolish trucks. I'm not saying that we tear up roads. I'm saying going forward, where should we be making investments if we want to grow our economy, have a more successful economy? And I think... There are many, many fewer alternatives to do that in freight transportation than there are in a lot of other areas. And I think, you know, I, I apologize, this is a very one-sided presentation because I think the more important question is what should we be investing in? And think about what all those other alternative investments are. But, you know, we're, we're, depend we're dependent on a lot of things. But the question is where should we be investing particularly scarce resources in order to, to get better results? And the other thing I'll just... Put my put my economist hat on a little more firmly now. If 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 we went to a system of road pricing, particularly for freight dependent facilities, and say if you want to buy more capacity, if you want to buy better service, if you want to buy faster travel times, then we should have uh, we should have trains <coughs> on the freeways for the people and for the freight that for whom it really matters. Then they can pay for it. Then they can express their demand for it. But I think when you when you look particularly the experience of truck tolling, most, <coughs> most trucking, for a whole variety of reasons, is pretty indifferent to um, marginal, and I mean 5, 10, 15 minute uh, time savings over a trip, that um, they, they won't uh, pay for it. Now, there are obvious exceptions. Now, one of, I left some slides out of here, but, but um, you know, the big freight movement that everybody, the, the signature one that everybody points to is, Intel has fabs over in Washington County, and they need to get their chips to Portland International Airport so that they can go to China to be assembled into uh, computer chips and then into computers. And we were told about 10 years ago that Intel was having to cut off its production runs earlier and earlier in the day because they were, couldn't be sure that they would get their truck from Hillsborough to the Portland Airport on time. Well, for about... Um, Two and a half million dollars uh, for a year, you could get a big cargo helicopter and fly it from Hillsboro to Portland and do that in about 15 minutes. Now, Intel doesn't, it's not worth, if Intel wanted to, they could spend the two and a half million dollars and they could get, they could have that level of service. In fact, Intel has a fleet of six airplanes that it uses to fly employees back and forth between Hillsboro and Santa Clara, California. <laughs> and it does that because the people who it hires are really valuable, and so is their time, and it's willing to spend the time to do it. Then I think you know the fact that they spend money on one thing and they don't spend it on the other tells you for the most valuable commodity in the region, most valuable physical commodity, that the you know the biggest employer isn't willing to spend the money on it. And the other thing I'll tell you is you know you can do this sort of standard human capital calculation that says each one of us. We have, a, we have a value of about $2.5 million economic terms. That's your human capital is average over everybody. So there are engineers here, so it's going to be higher. Um, but if you think about the amount of human capital that's traveling every day on our transportation system, it dwarfs by a couple of orders of magnitude the value of the physical stuff that we're moving. 
And your time is more, basically, your time as a human being is worth a lot more than the average value of, of any physical object that's moving on the road. And consequently, there's no reason why anybody's going to pay to save um, most of that freight any time. Whereas you as an individual will often pay to, to get better service. So. Well, thank you again for the presentation. Sure. My pleasure.